it's so hard to have you all muted and, and you're not laughing at my bad jokes. And so all I can do is look and I see Mickey and Kellen and Kayla and Hugh that are giving like these kind of, you know, pity, pity laughs and pity nods. So that keeps me going. So thank you guys. I love you. All right. So, um, okay, here we've got a new case. So here's um, a patient with um, some uh, multiple uh, papules and small nodules on their skin. And uh, what do you think the infiltrate is made of here? What kind of a situation is this? A little hard to tell. Yeah, it is, it, it's a good point. So these are histiocytes actually, for the most part. Um, but as someone pointed out, it's so blue, and this is this is from a, um, a different um, H and E stain than I'm used to using in my normal lab. At different labs have different H and E stains, and sometimes they're more pink or or, or uh, orange, and sometimes they're more bluish or purple. So this one is particularly kind of dark looking, and that can uh, kind of be challenging. And actually, a, a great a great comment that um, my fellowship program director Doug Parker told me is that you know when you're getting a consult case from another lab especially if it's something hard like a difficult melanocytic lesion said go ahead and if you're having trouble with the case get a recut and stain it in your own lab on your own h e so it's like you're playing on your home turf you know uh, you get the home field advantage he really likes sports and so he would always use those kind of um kind of great folksy sayings and i thought it was a good point is that you're you know you can learn to interpret any h e stain well within reason but uh, but it is your your threshold, particularly on things like how much atypia is enough atypia. Some of those things that involve color, you're used to looking at your own stain from your own lab every day, day in and day out for hundreds and thousands of cases. And so it's it's easiest when you're evaluating something using that. It, it, I don't always need that. Obvi I, obviously, I see lots of slides from outside labs um, and don't re require another H and E. But on hard cases, sometimes just getting another H and E is a very cheap way to to help you see like, am I worried about this because the H and E is different, or is this really atypia in, in, in the cells? All right. So here, these are mostly histiocytes, and in addition to that, the small little dark cells, of course, are lymphocytes. There's probably also some fibroblasts mixed in here. Couple, couple eosinophils there. Uh, a dead keratinocyte from the dry skin of someone who was preparing the slides. Um, so that's just a loose, loose dry skin um, squamous cell from the top of the the epidermis that's flaked off um, from someone preparing and handling the slides. So I, sometimes I forget to point out these little details, but because when you have experience in derm, have you just, you don't even see them anymore. They just are vanished, unless there's a bunch. And then I complain about, you know, that it needs to be a cleaner slide if I'm having a bad day and I'm being grumpy. But, um, but I, I think for beginners, I, I, I need to remember to point these things out uh, because otherwise um, it, it's hard to learn all of the little um, anomalies. Okay. So look, if you, if you, are you good? Do you guys uh, see them? And by them, I mean the visitors. There they are. They're all over actually, once you start looking, it's just so easy to focus on these big cells in here and not see the fact that there's tons of little yeast all over the place, each one with its own little capsule. And when I put air quotes around capsule, then now you should know what the diagnosis is. So what is this? So crypto is one thought, because crypto has a capsule, right? But crypto has a real capsule, not an air quotes capsule, okay? This is histoplasma capsulatum, because it looks like it has capsule, but it doesn't actually have a, a mucoid capsule around it like crypto does. It just makes these little artifactual spaces around it in the tissue. So how do we tell crypto from histo? I actually don't have a crypto pulled up, but crypto does have some small yeast, but it also has medium size and big yeast. It is pleomorphic yeast. I don't know if I keep using air quotes or not, but in any case, it's it's called pleomorphic because they're they're yeast of varying size, um, and that's a really helpful clue to me for crypto is that crypto should have small, medium, and large yeast, whereas in histo they are uniform, they're all the same size, and they're all really tiny in in regular histoplasma uh, capsulatum. Okay, um, the main differential when I'm thinking about histoplasma is what? What's the main other organism that can look very much like? Um, histo. See, there's more of them right there. There's yeast, 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 and there's like four of them together. Right, and you all got it, of course. It's Leishmania. Uh, Leishmania has organisms that are right about the same size, just a few microns in size, 
and they are very uniform. They tend to have a dense granulomatous background around them, and then they get they make little clusters um, in these little spaces, either inside the histiocytes or between a group of histiocytes. So the 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 buzzwords that you learn in books are that Leishmania has that kind of marquee sign or Ferris wheel sign where you get the organisms lining up around the outside of the space. Well, look, we're kind of getting a little bit of that right here. Maybe not as good, but I, I swear to you, I've seen histo cases that had beautiful marquee sign and they were not leashed, they were histo. So even though that's the buzzword for, uh, for leash mania, it doesn't always work. The other thing that we teach is that leash is supposed to have kinetoplasts, right? They're little protozoas and they have these little internal structures. Well, you know what? I've always said that kinetoplasts are like fake news. Like they're, they're only there in books and in real life, you can't see them. And I, can, I swear to you, I can find, look, see that little thing? Is it a kinetoplast? It's a little dot inside the, the uh, organism. I don't know if it's coming through okay on the other end there to see, but because these are really small things we're looking at. But you can find little dots on the inside of, of histo. It's like the cytoplasm staining um, in the cell wall uh, for the, the yeast is like clear. And so sometimes it will, um, it will look like there's some structure inside. Um, my friend Bobby Pritt, uh, who is um, a pathologist at Mayo Clinic and a microbiology expert, she actually enlightened me and showed me a section under oil. Um, and I can't remember the name of the stain, but there's a special stain with silver in it that stains the kinetoplast. And I was like, ah, now I believe they actually are real uh, kinetoplasts. Uh, they're a real thing. And again, for those of you watching on YouTube, I'll actually go find that tweet and put a link to it in the video description so you can see because it's a beautiful image. But basically with, with the proper staining and oil, um, you can actually find the kinetoplast, but they're quite hard to see otherwise. So what do you do to figure it out? Well, for one thing, if the patient lives in the Mississippi River Valley and has never been out of there to another country, it's probably histo and not leash, right? Because until just very recently, leash was only seen in other countries, like in the Middle East, and then there's also the uh, New World leash that's in, in Central and South America. But more recently, actually, um, some people have described cases of leash um, in near the border with Mexico, that's Leishmania me mexicana, um, I believe is the species name, and it's actually thought to have been picked up across the border in the United States, so that there's an idea that the sand flies that are migrating, and um, and I'm talking about the Mississippi River, whoever said, someone said that I'm picking on Mississippi, but I mean the Mississippi River Valley is an area where histoplasmosis is very common. So um, in any case, though, there are cases that, and the idea is that as climate change happens, that maybe there will be migration of those sand flies and that we'll actually start seeing more cases of endemic leash in the United States. It's very uncommon, I think, still, but it can potentially happen. So I think the easiest way, actually, before doing anything else, people love to talk about Gimsa as staining uh, leash, but not histo. But this is something else Bobby Pritt taught me on Twitter, which is why I'm a big fan of Twitter, because I, I teach a lot there, but I learn so much from other people. She said that the time where Gimsa works really well is not on tissue sections. It's when you do a smear, when you cut open the lesion of leash and you smear it, which is actually a common diagnostic technique done in countries where leash is endemic and common that you do a smear and then you stain that with Gimsa and it makes the organism stand out very nicely. But she said that in her experience um, on tissue sections, on paraffin embedded tissue sections, that Gimsa actually doesn't work terribly well to highlight leash mania. So what I find most useful is just do a GMS. A GMS stain will beautifully light up the fungi and it will show the budding of the yeast and the budding is something that only is gonna happen in histo and not in leash. So this case is really interesting because basically the infiltrate is so dense here that if you're, if you're having a bad day and you don't see the organisms, you could think that you might be dealing with a tumor. This is almost like what we would call a pseudotumor, um, a pseudotumor that's being induced by the fungus. So both um, fungal infections and mycobacterial infections, uh, leprosy and atypical mycobacteria, they can induce so much inflammatory, granulomatous, and fibroblastic response to the organism that it looks like a solid cellular nodule and you can mistake it for a neoplasm. Um, I've definitely seen that. Like in leprosy, it's called histoid leprosy as a form of like pseudotumoral uh, leprosy that can look very much like a neoplasm. And here's an example, again, where you've got the organisms, the, the histo fungus, sitting right in little spaces inside the, um, the, um, inside the histiocytes, because we always teach these are obligate intracellular uh, organisms that they live inside uh, histiocytes in our body. But not always. So here's a biopsy. 
And uh, it basically from low power looks almost like normal skin, I would argue. There's, there's the epidermis looks pretty much normal. Uh, the dermis might have a bit of edema or something. There's a, a touch of kind of smudginess here, but very little inflammation, relatively normal architecture. Uh, so this looks like kind of the normal skin differential. When you go closer, you can see there's actually a bit of hemorrhage here um, in the dermis. But again, not much inflammation. Here there's like one plasma cell maybe, some histiocytes, maybe the edge of an eosinophil. What's all this? All this stuff here, these are all little tiny yeast organisms, millions of them. I've, this is the only case I've ever seen quite like this. So this is also ended up being on culture um, histoplasmosis. Why is there no infiltrate? I mean, I don't think these are living inside histiocytes. They're free living right here in the middle of the dermis. And exactly, one of you said, this is because the patient was totally immunosuppressed. They had like no white cells. So I think this was an AIDS patient actually that was, was HIV positive and not on uh, therapy and actually had uncontrolled um, AIDS. And so the fungus just kind of overgrew in the dermis and there was not enough of the immune system available to mount a response against it. Really, uh, really dramatic and, and amazing example that I've not seen another case quite like this. I've seen this with like angioinvasive fungus that are hyphae, but I don't think I've ever seen a case with this many histoplasma organisms and just almost no inflammatory response. What's also interesting to me is there's actually organisms in the epidermis here. You're getting histo that are getting up into the middle of like either, I can't tell if this is um, an acrosyringium uh, from the sweat duct or if it's a hair follicle cut at an angle, but they're actually here where you're not normally, histo normally is in the dermis, not in the epidermis at all. So it's a good lesson that there are exceptions to the rule, and particularly when people get immunocompromised severely, I feel like that's when we see the exceptions um, happen the most. We see times where fungus is growing where it shouldn't be, in ways that it shouldn't be, in patterns that it doesn't normally have. So we always have to keep a high index of suspicion, and, um, and especially when someone's immune suppressed. So I will show you the, um, the PowerPoint here. I pulled up some pictures. Nobody full screen. So here, all of the organisms are staining with GMS. And you can see those ones that were in the, um, that little hair follicle or acrosyringium. And you can even see that they're in the, well, I'll show you. They're in the epidermis right here. They're like growing through the epidermis. Crazy, crazy case. There's a closer look. And it really makes the organisms much more visible. Even though we can see them on the H&E, I think it's really nice to visualize them here. And I think you can tell, uh, where's a good example? You can actually see, see there's like one, one yeast and then the little baby yeast budding off. Here right there is a, a mama yeast and a baby, or I guess they're like sisters or something. I don't know, because they're, they're clone. I don't, I don't even know what analogy to make, but big yeast and small yeast. So finding the budding of the yeast, to me, is very helpful in telling this is not leash mania, okay? This is definitely fungus because you actually have budding yeast structures. And the fungus, the only fungus, the, the main fungus that looks like this would be histoplasma. Um, I think sometimes penicillium can have some similar, it's very tiny also, we rarely ever see it. Um, I've only seen, I think, one example from the skin from a friend from another country, they sent me pictures. I've never seen a case of penicillium um, or nephii in real life, uh, to my knowledge. And here's a closer look. And this is, I think, with the 60X uh, objective. Um, and you can again see kind of how the, the little um, baby daughter yeast is being pinched off there from the, the larger one. And so that is really, really helpful to find the budding of the yeast, tells us that we're, we're really seeing this um, and it's truly yeast. All right, so kind of uh, both ends of the spectrum uh, there, we had the, the case that has absolutely no inflammatory response and the case that has like overwhelming inflammatory response, so much so that it almost looks like a, a neoplasm, a pseudotumor. Okay.